welcome to today's um, webinar. We're going to be talking about preconceptual health and fertility optimization. My name is Carmelo Scarlata. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and the director of integral health services at uh, ORM Fertility, located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, for a great majority of the time, I'm going to go off camera and allow you to enjoy the slides. Uh, and then at the end, uh, there will be a question and answer session available. You'll be able to submit questions uh, to the webinar, and then we'll be glad to answer those uh, at the end of the session. So again, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to the next 45 minutes or so being a, a useful time for you. Give me just a, give us a second to get things set up. All right, I think we have our technical issues uh, resolved. Uh, welcome back. So we're gonna talk about a, a number of topics today. Uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, useful no matter where you are in your fertility journey, if you're just beginning to think about starting a family or if you're actively uh, pursuing, uh, attempting or infertility therapy. So um, one of the questions that we're commonly asked is, uh, are there things we can do to help optimize our opportunity to become pregnant? And that's where we talk about fertility optimization and timing. Um, lifestyle factors are very important uh, when it comes to uh, becoming pregnant as well as having a successful pregnancy. Um, and this sets the stage for a healthy outcome for not only pregnancy, but for the child and that child's future. Uh, and that's a very important area that more information is now coming out. Uh, the environment preconception and during pregnancy can have a profound and positive effect on uh, th that child's uh, future health and well-being. Uh, we'll talk a bit about diet and nutrition to optimize for fertility and pregnancy, uh, and then some tools that will help you aid uh, in successful pregnancy and conception. So. Uh, the first question that's always asked is, when should I begin planning for pregnancy? And um, I like to always joke that we should probably plan for pregnancy our entire life, but that's certainly not uh, uh, something that most of us do. So the honest answer is, in preparing for pregnancy, we probably honestly need to think at least three to six months in advance. The reason for this is we know that eggs, as they begin to awaken prior to the time of ovulation, when the egg releases, this process can be somewhere between three to six months. So events happening three to six months before the actual date of ovulation could have uh, influence both negative and positive on the ability of conception and the outcome of a pregnancy. Uh, and that's why we generally want patients to begin lifestyle changes uh, at least three months before attempting pregnancy. This is true for both men and women. Um, in men, we know that sperm production cycles are 75 to 90 days. So that events that happen 75 to 90 days before intercourse uh, could have a negative influence on the quality uh, of the sperm and the subsequent uh, results of a pregnancy. So optimizing one's general health and well-being, uh, trying to eliminate certain habits uh, and chemicals in the environment can help improve the fertility in both men and women uh, throughout their lives. Uh, so as we mentioned in women, we think at least three to six months in advance. Um, and this is because women are born with all the eggs they ever have. They're in a resting state. And over time, these eggs move from the resting state to begin to activate to ultimately ovulate. In fact, each month, perhaps as many as 20 to 50 eggs might prepare to release. But in a natural, normal cycle, only one egg ultimately releases and is capable of being fertilized. Um, as we said, in men, we would think at least three months in advance because of sperm production cycles. Um, and once pregnant, we want to, again, continue to have good, healthy lifestyles for women because in the early portions of pregnancy, the fetus, as it's developing, is most uh, susceptible to outside influences such as chemicals and toxins. 
Uh, and the most critical time for fetal development is actually from a time of conception through the first six weeks of pregnancy from the standpoint of environmental and chemical exposures. Um, part of planning is also to know the odds and what are the chances of potentially getting pregnant. Um, generally, we say uh, if a woman is less than 35 years of age, has no history of fertility problems, has regular periods, if she has a male partner and he's healthy with no normal fertility issues, the chance of getting pregnant in any given month is around 15 to 20 percent. Um, if a woman is 40 or 45, the chance of getting pregnant on a monthly rate unfortunately drops, and that's what this particular uh, graph will show you. If we look at age 40, uh, in the first three months of attempting, the average monthly pregnancy rate is about 7 percent. So um, the duration of time that one is attempting pregnancy as well as the female age can have substantial uh, impact on the ability to get pregnant. Uh, this type of table gives us information to allow us to understand that the definition of infertility is one year of regular unprotected intercourse without pregnancy in a woman who's less than 35. And after 35, we generally advise women if they've been attempting six months or longer that they may consider evaluation. In women over 40, it's important to talk to your healthcare provider once you're beginning to attempt pregnancy to make sure that everything is optimized to improve your chances for pregnancy and a successful outcome. Um, age does matter. And uh, what was implied in that uh, chart and shown in this graph is that maternal age does have a significant impact on fertility. Uh, peak fertility in women probably occurs in the mid-20s. And by the early 30s, there's a small but real decline in fertility. And by the time age 40 comes, the decline in female fertility is rather significant. Um, if we look at the, the graphic that is on this particular slide, to the left side of the slide, we'll see the, a blue line, and that blue line starts at the top and goes to the, toward the bottom. And what that line is showing is relative fertility declining over maternal age. Uh, adjacent to that blue line, there is a gold or yellow line, and that's the incidence of miscarriage. And unfortunately, what we see with increasing maternal age is while there's a time where there's decreasing fertility, when women do become pregnant, Unfortunately, miscarriage begins to become more common. And also, we know there's an increased risk of certain genetic abnormalities such as Down syndrome related to maternal age. So maternal age is an important factor. When we look at these graphs, it simply says from population statistics that it may be harder to get pregnant as we age. It may be a greater risk of miscarriage but it doesn't guarantee there's going to be infertility, nor does it guarantee that there will be a miscarriage or a baby with Down syndrome. We're simply saying those events may occur more frequently. Uh, for men, we do know that men's fertility can decline with age. It seems to decline much more slowly than women, um, especially in men uh, beyond 40 to 45 years of age. And there may be a slight increase in, in certain uh, genetic birth defects in older men, but the relative rate of these are actually quite very low. But uh, men's fertility can be negatively influenced by age, especially if there are other medical factors or lifestyle factors that may negatively influence a gentleman's uh, sperm production. I mentioned fertility timing in one of the early slides. Um, and there's a lot of information and misinformation about when is a woman's most fertile time. Well, when the egg releases from the ovary, our best estimate is that the egg is fertile for no more than 24 hours. When sperm are placed in the woman's body, if sperm are normal, they can survive in the uterus and fallopian tubes anywhere between 48 hours to seven days. So studies have shown the best time for intercourse or pregnancy is intercourse preceding or right at the time of ovulation. And that once ovulation has occurred within 24 hours after the egg releases, uh, fertilization rates are much lower and the likelihood of pregnancy is quite small. So the best fertility timing for pregnancy would be around the time of ovulation. Um, many women can predict that by simply looking at their 
uh, cycle interval and calculating approximal time. Some women may use home ovulation prediction tests or basal temperature charts. There are a number of different tools, even apps now that are available to give a better idea of when the more fertile time in a woman's cycle might be. Um, generally speaking, the best intercourse for fertility is regular frequent intercourse every day to every other day around ovulation. So if we think a woman is ovulating, let's say on average day 14 of her cycle, it's probably best if we try to have timed intercourse beginning around day 10 to 11 and going through day uh, 15 or 16. That way, in case ovulation occurs a little bit early or a little bit late in that cycle, we have good coverage. We know that if men have normal sperm parameters, that frequent intercourse should not dramatically reduce their sperm concentration or motility. And in fact, men who have long periods of abstinence between um, intercourse or ejaculation, sperm quality actually deteriorates. So the best intercourse for pregnancy is regular intercourse every day or every other day around the time of ovulation. Uh, one question that's often asked, is orgasm necessary for the female for conception to occur? And the answer is female orgasm is not needed or necessary for conception. Um, another question is often asked about uh, sexual intercourse. Is there a specific time of the day, a position, a number of different things? And the, the simple answer is timing of the day or position of sexual activity does not negatively or positively influence the ability to get pregnant. Um, we know that genetics are an important uh, portion of uh, reproduction. Uh, we're born with our, our, our 46 chromosomes. We inherit 23 chromosomes from both our mother and father. Um, and sometimes we can inherit genetic diseases that can be passed on to the next generation. There are a number now of uh, genetic tests that are available to potential parents to look and see if they're silent carriers of certain medical conditions that might be screened for during pregnancy or perhaps would require if both the couple uh, or carriers a consideration of in vitro fertilization. But there's also a new concept, uh, one called epigenetic changes. And epigenetic changes are really changes not in the DNA, but how the DNA functions, the functions of the genes. And we know that lifestyle and certain exposures can affect how our genes function. So it's not only the DNA, the hard wiring that we have, but also how environment can interact with our genes to have both positive and negative influences on fertility uh, and successful pregnancy outcome. That's why lifestyle can be a very important factor in helping improve our chances for pregnancy and a successful uh, birth of a healthy child. Um, in lifestyle for fertility, mm -hmm. There are a number of different events that we know that can reduce fertility in women. Uh, the most common uh, would be tobacco smoking. Uh, women who are both high and low body weight, women who are very thin or very overweight are more prone to ovulation difficulties. They may either not ovulate or have lack of regular ovulation that can make it more difficult for pregnancy to occur. Women who have vigorous exercise, especially women who are very thin, this also can affect negatively our ability to ovulate. Um, there's evidence to show that women who work in shifts, uh, the evening shifts, such as 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., may be more uh, subject to having ovulation disorders, lack of regular ovulation. Um, it's felt that alcohol, more than four beverages a week, may actually reduce a woman's fertility. Um, and this is the same amount that we generally talk about for men. A uh, question that often comes up is how much caffeine is safe. Um, the studies are very reassuring that if you consume less than 200 milligrams of caffeine a day, 200 milligrams is about 12 ounces of brewed coffee, of regular coffee, appears safe and does not reduce fertility, nor does it increase the risk of miscarriage. Um, herbs, many herbs may be safe, but because of lack of uh, study and safety for some herbal products, we generally do advise patients to avoid taking herbal preparations when they're attempting pregnancy and in pregnancy, unless under the care of a specific herbal specialist. For men, many of the same uh, concepts are the same, tobacco smoking, high weight in men can reduce sperm quality. Um, exercise and heat tend to have less of an effect on men. However, men who work in a very hot, 
high heat environment may have some reduction in sperm parameters. We know that EMR, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones, potentially can reduce sperm quality. So I tell all gentlemen to keep cell phones out of their front pants pockets for that reason. Uh, processed meats, especially pork products, can reduce sperm uh, quality. And similar to women, we advise uh, keeping alcohol consumption to four beverages or less a week. One specific area for men is anabolic steroids or uh, performance enhancing supplements. Many of these supplements have male type hormone and some of these male hormones can actually have negative influences on fertility, including uh, reducing sperm production and in some cases completely blocking and preventing sperm production. Um, there's always lastly the question of boxers versus briefs. Um, boxers may have some slight advantage for men with lower sperm count and motility, but switching from briefs to boxers does not necessarily improve a man's fertility. Um, this table just uh, gives you uh, relative risk of some of the lifestyle factors that may negatively influence pregnancy, and I'll let you review that uh, at your leisure. It really will go along with what we've talked about today. Um, one quick comment about alcohol. When we talk about four servings a week, we really need to discuss what is a serving of alcohol. Generally speaking, a serving of beer is 12 ounces, a serving of wine is five ounces, and a serving of hard, hard alcohol will be one to two ounces depending on uh, the proof or amount of alcohol within the particular beverage. So as a regular guy, a routine, a, a regular uh, beer would be uh, 12 ounces, uh, a glass of wine, white or red, would be five ounces, and uh, a shot of alcoholic, uh, such as bourbon or brandy, uh, might be one to 1 1.5 uh, mLs. Uh, cannabis is certainly a very popular topic. There are now 28 states and the District of Columbia where cannabis products are uh, legal for either recreational or medicinal use. Unfortunately, there's very little information about the safety or efficacy of cannabis products for attempting pregnancy or during pregnancy. The current guidelines would indicate that there is no amount of cannabis products safe during pregnancy. As far as attempting pregnancy, there are studies that show that cannabis can negatively influence sperm production and quality in some cases may reduce testosterone production in male libido, and in women uh, may have negative influences on ovulation and egg quality. For that reason, at this point in time, uh, uh, there are no recommended amounts of cannabis, whether it's a THC or CBD product that we can say we know is safe and would not have any negative influence on uh, attempting pregnancy. Uh, weight, I mentioned, is important, especially uh, women who are at the very extremes of weight, women who are very, very low in their weight with a body mass index of less than 18, or women with a body mass index above 35 considered moderate obesity. Both of these conditions can lead to lack of regular ovulation, which makes it more difficult to become pregnant. We also know that women that are, are, are very overweight, especially the body mass over 35, appear to be more prone to miscarriage and they may have uh, more obstetrical complications. Uh, they seem to be more prone to developing gestational diabetes, pregnancy diabetes. They're more prone to developing high blood pressure, what we call pregnancy-induced hypertension in pregnancy, and also maybe at greater risk for uh, preterm labor um, and other complications. So optimally, having um, an optimal weight and body mass going into pregnancy will improve the chances of both becoming pregnant and the outcome of pregnancy for women. In men, body mass is above 35. Again, men considered moderate uh, obese uh, may reduce sperm uh, count and motility, and that may lead to prolonged times of infertility and reduced fertility for men. Diet is an important preparatory part of uh, becoming pregnant and pregnancy, of course. There are a number of different diets that have been studied and looked at to try to optimize uh, a woman and a man's fertility. Most of the studies show that the diets uh, are very similar for both men and women. Um, on the left, you'll see a book called The Fertility Diet. This is a, a well thought and researched uh, 
book. You don't need to go out and buy it. Uh, most of the information is available online. But this book primarily looks at uh, the benefits of the Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diet. And in fact, the studies that have been looked at diets show that the so-called classic Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diets seem to be the diets that are most beneficial for both male and female fertility. Um, the Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diet is really based on being a more plant-based, whole grain diet, reducing the amounts of saturated fats, increasing the amount of monosaturated fats such as olive oil or avocado oil, um, and increasing fish intake while reducing uh, red meat intake. So uh, eating healthy is really a basic portion of the Mediterranean diet. To eat a balanced diet, um, to maintain fluid intake, and fluid should be water over sugar-sweetened beverages or energy drinks, um, increasing lean protein by white meats such as chicken or fish, consuming whole grains rather than processed foods or processed food products, um, limiting our sugars and our simple starches in our diet, um, and increasing our fruit and vegetable intake. It's recommended that with this diet, that uh, one uh, receives approximately five servings of fruit and five servings of vegetables a day. And also in this type of diet, to try to average eight to 12 ounces, two to three servings of fish per week. Um, I have some rules that I recommend my patients to eat by, one of which is to eat variety and color. Uh, the color of fruits and vegetables, of produce, are all uh, different pigments and antioxidants that have a number of uh, beneficial influences. It's important not to skip meals, to try to eat at least three meals a day, and each meal get carbohydrate, protein, and fat in that meal. Uh, we do want to remember portion control and, and try to keep our portion. Uh, and also organic products. It's important to consider buying organic, especially when it comes to produce. Uh, the Environmental Working Group has a very nice graph called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And the Dirty Dozen are the 12 fruits and vegetables that ideally we should buy organic. I recommend all my patients to buy organic dairy products and poultry. And the two areas I really want you to look at in labeling is antibiotic and hormone free. Uh, we want to keep antibiotics and hormones out of the animals, products that we're consuming. These can disrupt our own endocrine or hormonal systems and have negative influence on our fertility. Um, vitamins are a complement to our diet, not a um, substitute. Um, for good nutrition, and I think this is very important. Um, we do uh, believe that uh, vitamin supplementation is important. For women, the most important supplement is folic acid, at least 400 micrograms starting one to three months before attempting pregnancy. Folic acid um, has been shown to reduce the risk of one of the more common birth defects, spina bifida, which is called a neural tube defect. Um, there are some women that may require higher doses of folic acid, and we would determine that by their family or personal history. Um, vitamin D is an important vitamin, especially those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest. We often have vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. So it, I recommend patients to have their vitamin D level measured, and if they're either insufficient or deficient, to take a vitamin D supplement. It's a simple form of replenishment to get vitamin D levels back into the normal range. And there are a number of studies now to imply that women who are deficient in vitamin D may have lower outcomes uh, with uh, in vitro fertilization or in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, Omega-3 supplementation, fish oil supplements can be helpful, and we think they're most important to start once pregnant to help with fetal uh, neural or nervous system development. There are supplements that we often will recommend for our patients, depending on their clinical situation. Um, environmental factors are also very important to consider. We're exposed to any number of chemicals and potential toxins in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so we want to be just mindful of uh, things that we might be exposed to. Uh, our biz biggest exposures are going to be through food and drink, and primarily from the processing of the food products we eat, and also the vessels that we may drink from, or the preparation of our food. Um, so we do want to keep in mind environmental factors uh, when we're considering our fertility. 
um, and our ability to have a successful pregnancy. Um, I advise patients to ideally drink filtered water if possible, avoid plastic containers, even BPA-free plastic containers still have plasticizers, they're either other bisphenates or phthalates. Plasticizers, these chemicals can leach from the plastics into our fluids and have the ability to disrupt or alter our endocrine system. Uh, plasticizers tend to have estrogen, female hormone-like activity that can disrupt ovulation and sperm production. So I do suggest uh, using stainless steel, glass, or ceramic uh, products for beverages, especially for hot or warm beverages, and the same for food storage and preparation. There are some foods that are potentially contaminated we need to be mindful of. Uh, fish, we know that certain fish uh, have heavy metal uh, contamination, per primarily mercury, and there are a number of very good uh, resources that you can avail yourself to look at what fish are the safest to consume. Because as I mentioned, as part of the Mediterranean diet or fertility diet, it's recommended that we consume eight to 12 ounces of fish a week. Uh, BPA is, uh, uh, again, a, a chemical that is commonly found in plastics, but it's also found in certain canned foods. And ideally, we should really try to avoid eliminate our BPA exposure. Phthalates, as I mentioned, are in plastics, but they also can be in processed foods. And we should also be mindful of the consumption of raw meat, fish, eggs, and dairy because of potential bacterial contamination. Um, personal care products are another place that uh, we may have significant exposure to chemicals. Uh, our skin is a very effective absorber of many chemicals. Um, so keep in mind the personal products you use. Uh, there are, again, a number of websites where you can go to and look for more green or healthier alternatives for personal care products. Um, hot tubs, we do tell men, especially to avoid the use of hot tubs, saunas, and jacuzzis. Um, these high temperature environments have been shown to reduce sperm production and quality. And reductions in sperm production and quality uh, after hot tub or sauna use can persist up to 90 days for some, some men. So being in a hot tub once can have uh, effects perhaps for as much as three months in advance. We are concerned about electromagnetic radiation, and that's why I always mention to men to keep their cell phones out of their front pants pocket. Exercise and movement will help improve fertility. And we know that uh, moderate, regular exercise can benefit both men and women to enhance fertility. Um, it's recommended that both men and women try to get at least 150 minutes of activity a week, uh, five episodes of activity, 30 minutes a day. But we also know that even if it's in five or 10 minute increments during the day, that movement and physical activity can help benefit uh, both sperm production and egg quality. So uh, get up and move is important. Uh, for women, we do have to be careful, especially women who are underweight or have certain nutritional uh, deficiencies to avoid extreme or excessive exercise more than four hours a week. Um, getting up and moving is important. Walking counts as exercise. Going upstairs counts as exercise. So getting active and moving is important. Um, and with that in mind, uh, nationally, we have campaigns now to think about uh, 30 minutes five times a week or 150 minutes a week. Uh, move, but it's move your way is the particular campaign that's shown here. But the idea is to get up and be active. This can help improve our fertility for both men and women. Uh, sedentary lifestyles can have negative influence, especially on sperm production and quality. Sleep is important for fertility for both men and women, and it appears the sweet spot for sleep is about seven to eight hours a night. Uh, women who sleep less than five hours a night and men more than 14 hours a night uh, do have reduction in either egg quality or sperm quality. Um, night shifts, as I mentioned, sometimes can disrupt ovulation. So if a woman is working the night shift and having menstrual regularities, she might consider talking to her employer about trying to go to a day or a swing shift that may help improve ovulatory function. Uh, Self-care is also very important during the fertility process, not only preparing, but for those of you who might uh, be undergoing therapy right now for fertility, it's very important for what I call ME, me time, to take time from yourself, 
to be able to practice safe care. There's some concepts here, uh, especially at night, try to turn off from the TV, the cell phone, the pad, have some quiet time where you, if you have a partner, can spend time together. Um, try to disconnect and, and um, concentrate on the positive things, uh, emphasize things that you enjoy and practice some type of practice daily. Um, our time management is very important. This can help when you're going through therapy, make the therapy go a little bit easier and hopefully, hopefully be a good stress reduction tool. Um, there are a number of complementary therapies that we use in fertility management. Uh, the list that's listed here is certainly not comprehensive, but many of our patients are taking some form of a supplement. Um, there are a number of mind-body tools that have been shown to be helpful for patients with infertility. Um, cognitive behavior therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction are two forms of therapy that have been uh, looked at and do appear to have great stress management abilities but also uh, improve pregnancy outcomes in patients attempting on their own and going through therapy. Acupuncture is a common mind-body tool that's been used to help enhance fertility in both men and women. Um, Ayurvedic medicine and naturopathy are also whole systems that have been used. Um, yoga is a very good mind-body tool. It incorporates movement, breath work, and forms of meditation. Uh, so there are a number of different uh, complementary uh, therapies that are available to patients. Discuss these with your provider. They may be able to give you some guidance on what tools might be most beneficial for you. Um, this is a list of many of the common supplements that have been used for women for fertility. Please do not write down all of these supplements and go out to the internet and immediately buy them. Um, all of these in combination do not necessarily improve fertility and too many supplements may actually have a negative effect. What I will tell you is many of these supplements, while they have potential for improving fertility, um, have very little scientific backing to show that they actually improve human fertility. Similarly, we have a number of supplements for men. And interestingly enough, supplements for men have more study and more information available, especially antioxidants such as uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, folic acid, and fish oil do seem to help improve sperm function quality in men with uh, sperm abnormalities. Uh, but again, depending on what sperm abnormality a gentleman may have, uh, it's important for his provider uh, to give them guidance as to which of these supplements will be most beneficial and at what dosing. Uh, just don't go out and buy every supplement on the market because somebody said it improved fertility. Uh, the National Institute of Health has an excellent website on dietary supplements and fact sheets. Uh, and this is a, a very good resource to go to if you want more scientific information, uh, not commercial, but scientific uh, vetted information on supplements. And I uh, recommend that if you're interested in supplement use to uh, avail yourself of this website and the information they provide. Um, I mentioned mind-body tools for fertility management. One of the simplest is breathing exercises. Breathing exercises are often a fundamental portion of meditation and yoga. Uh, yoga incorporates movement, meditation, and breathing. Uh, and these techniques can be found to be helpful for stress management. And this may help improve fertility and also improve the ability to relax and have resilience as you go through fertility therapies. Um, there is a lot of uh, interest in acupuncture to improve fertility, and there are a number of reasons to believe that acupuncture, in fact, can be beneficial for fertility. It may uh, help modulate and, and normalize hormones. It has been shown uh, to improve blood flow to the uterus and ovaries. Um, it is a very good uh, stress management tool or a stress mediator. Um, the difficulty with acupuncture is knowing whether it in fact really improves pregnancy rates. Most of the literature with acupuncture has been looking at in vitro fertilization. There are now some 46 reports looking at acupuncture and in vitro fertilization pregnancy outcomes. And unfortunately, about half the studies show benefit and half the studies show no benefit. Um, I really do not believe there's a downside to fertility uh, management with acupuncture. The real question is, will acupuncture improve fertility? Acupuncture certainly can help reduce stress. It can help uh, with resilience. Um, and I think those are benefits to acupuncture.
Um, it's a very difficult tool to study scientifically to prove cause and effect. The patients that seem to get the greatest benefit from acupuncture are patients that have had previous failed treatment cycles um, or patients uh, who experience lots of emotional stress. Um, there are a number of other tools as you're going through the fertility journey. Uh, ask questions, and this is true as you're preparing for pregnancy. Ask questions of your provider what things you can do to prepare uh, for a healthy pregnancy. Are there any other tests or uh, laboratory studies that would be ideal to be done before you're attempting pregnancy or once you are? Um, it's very important to remember that you're not alone, that fertility management is a collaboration of a number of different partners, uh, not only your partner, but the, the practice partners that you're working with. Um, if you can, and you're undergoing fertility therapy, try to uh, set a treatment schedule that works around your daily schedule. We're all busy. We all have lives and duties and responsibilities. And what's very important is to set a realistic goal. But I mean, what I mean by that is discuss with your healthcare provider um, what treatment options you have available and what is the expected success and unfortunately failure of those treatments. So as we go into a treatment, we know exactly what to expect hopefully, and um, we can go in things with a very positive mindset. Um, when attempting pregnancy, planning ahead is paramount, as we mentioned early on. Um, I mentioned about completing medical testing. If you're just beginning the evaluative process or beginning to think about pregnancy, talk to your provider. Are there any other tests or any immunizations or other studies that you should do before you attempt pregnancy? If you have a chronic medical condition, such as diabetes or high blood pressure, or on prescription medicines, discuss those with your provider so that there may be better or safer alternatives, both attempting pregnancy and during pregnancy, for the medications you're currently taking. Um, very important, discuss any and all supplements, over-the-counter, and herbal preparations you're taking with your provider. It's very important we know what you're taking so we can make sure we're giving you the best possible advice in making sure things you're taking might not have a negative influence or impact on your fertility. All women should be on a folic acid supplement, as I mentioned, at least 0.4 milligrams at least one to three months before attempting pregnancy. And once attempting pregnancy, women, we want you to stay on that folic acid throughout the times you're attempting pregnancy and throughout pregnancy itself. Eating healthy. Uh, diet is important, and the low glycemic Mediterranean or any inflammatory diet is the preferable diet for fertility. Um, maintaining or obtaining optimal body weight is always an ideal goal for our general health and well being, as is uh, moderate, low pack, regular exercise. Um, smoking, stop smoking if you smoke. This includes vaping and marijuana, cannabis products. Keeping alcohol consumption, this slide says less than two a week. What I tell patients is keep alcohol consumption to two to four beverages a week and try to spread out alcohol consumption, not having four beverages all at once. Um, I mentioned caffeine is safe. We generally recommend 200 milligrams of caffeine or less per day. And think about environmental factors that we might be able to eliminate or avoid in our day-to-day -day lives. Sleep and stress management are important as well as self-care. And remember to communicate with your partner, with your friends, your family, and your providers. Um, I've listed at the end of our uh, discussion a few resources that I find helpful and patients have told me are helpful for them. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll find uh, a resource here that may be helpful to you. With that, we're going to end our formal portion of this seminar. And if we have any questions, we would be glad to answer them at this point in time. At this time, we have no questions. So we'll go ahead and um, stop the seminar today. If you have questions, you can submit them via the website. Um, and we will uh, attempt to get back to you. So thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. I hope you've been found it to be informational. And we wish you best in your journey, whether you're just beginning or in the middle of therapy. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.